It's a very important youth month for me as minister because we are going to finally um, see the serious progress made on our national youth policy. Our youth policy is a very important document that will guide how we develop our young people over the next couple of years. And so we will be having the launch of that youth um, program. Uh, in other words, in addition to that, this month we are also looking to ensure that we have a sports policy uh, for St. Lucia. That is another very huge document that will really guide how we develop our sporting prowess over the next couple of years. Um, this year in Youth Month, we'll also see the final launch of Skill 758, an app that is geared towards getting all the skills on island at a one-stop shop available to St. Lucians in search of employees, also in the OECS and of course the rest of the world. So we're excited about that. And of course, we'll have our usual youth parliament and activities going on in every nook and cranny in this nation. Very good. Um, I was astonished when I spoke to some of the younger individuals, and I said this in my, uh, my brief remarks when Julian came in. The Cicero Primary School, we saw a number of the students in uniform, and I went over to them at the UNO International Airport, and I asked, who, who here is going to be the next Julian Alfred? And male and female put their hand up. And so me, for me, that shows that she's been a transformative figure for both male and female in this nation. And I think having her on display like this only will motivate young people to see when you actually accomplish something for your country, how much they will appreciate you. Um, and so, I mean, it was really amazing to see, I mean, the, the taboo dancers, the taboo itself, the stilt walkers, and I mean, the young people. And I mean, it was really heartwarming to see uh, Julian emotional when she got to Cicero, where she was born and raised. Um, so, I mean, we as a government, we believe in young people, and we believe that when young people achieve good things, we need to acknowledge it. We hear so much about the negative ills in our society, and when we have one young person doing so well, it's only incumbent upon us to ensure that the whole world knows, and I think the whole world knows that St. Lucia truly appreciates the efforts of Julian Alfred, and we as a government will continue to ensure that we do that as much as possible in August when she brings home that first Olympic medal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The ambition I have as a Minister of Sport is for us to have a 400 meter track available to our athletes north, south, east and west. Um, uh, it's an ambition that I have and I don't think we'll be able to achieve it uh, within two and a half years or first two. But it is something I believe we need to have available to athletes. And it's not just to athletes. When you have a track uh, north, south, east, west, you have the elderly being able to use it on afternoons, in the morning, the community being a healthier community. But talent identification, when you have a 400 meter track available to a community, it just means that very early on, one of the first things in sport, and people ask why am I so passionate about track and field, it's because I know it's the simplest sport to identify talent. Every single one of us here, and anybody who's heard my voice, they would admit that one of the first things, they, or one of the first experiences they had when they were on a field was to challenge the next person to see who, who was faster. i faster than you, are you faster than me? No, no, no. And so when you invest in facilities north, south, east, and west, we really will continue to develop track and field in St. Lucia. And so with the sports policy, we would see also that there's the facilities management side of um, the policy, the facilities upgrade. And we've, we've passed that part a long time ago. And so we're certainly hoping that as the year goes by, within our year of infrastructure and within the amount um, set aside by the Prime Minister, that we can have some significant upgrades to most of our facilities. Yes. Uh, what could you tell us about the rehabilitation of um, the George 
Ah, the George Odlum Stadium in terms of the rehabilitation, uh, the Minister of Finance would be able to finish with a lot more information as it pertains to timelines, as it pertains to contracts, as it pertains to um, the dynamics of re-establishing the George Odlum Stadium. I will say that it's a very ambitious project. It's a project that would require a significant amount of investment because it is going to be one of the uh, registered um, facilities uh, worldwide, globally, the Olympic movement uh, would have to come in and ensure that all the works are done properly. And so the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports will continue to be the technical guidance for all the works that are going on there. But for now, that is all I have in terms of information on how we move forward in re-establishing the George Autumn Stadium. Yes, uh, in terms of your constituency, mm -hmm. you know, we have 15 projects ongoing in the constituency of Grosley. Four of them are major projects, uh, including the Darren Sami uh, cricket grounds, including the aquatic center, including the um, the Grosley Recreational Area and including the Grosley playing field being transitioned into a mini stadium. Um, but these are creating impacts because we have a lot of young people employed. And I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I'm not seeing enough Grosley people employed at these facilities. Newsflash, Grosley is a large constituency. So a lot of persons who say that they are thinking of Grosley Town, but we have a lot of persons from Moshi, from Deramo, from Monier, from Grand Riviere, and surrounding communities employed at the Darren Sammy Cricket Grounds, employed at the facility, um, Pigeon, Pigeon Island, and employed at the Grosley Playing Field right now. And of course, as I said, a number of other projects. We have the Norbe Road uh, infrastructure being developed as well. And you will see more roads being developed we, as we head towards World Cup. In terms of socioeconomic impact, I think a lot of persons right now, if you go to, if you speak to any small business owner, they will be telling you the effects of all this government has been investing in our infrastructure in every single nook and cranny. Businesses are starting to see better days for sure. Um, even social programs, Grosley have a number of social programs ongoing, including a music program, including a program for after school at Grand Vier, including uh, we're about to launch Dress for Success in the community of Grosley for all constituents in Grosley who have you know, difficulty in actually getting clothing to attend an interview or to go to work. And so as a constituency, we have a lot going on in Grosley. Uh, I don't get much time off as a parliamentary rep for Grosley and I'm proud of the work that we are putting in in that constituency. I think first and foremost we have to really look at ourselves. I think every individual has a responsibility to ensure that they take care of facilities and that was always my concern when I said left to me and I stand by this and I will say it again, left to me, sports is for sports men and women and for fans in stands, that's the way I see it and so I am one of those who believe that the facilities that are for sports should be for sports and I believe that we can invest in having facilities for social events north, south, east and west in our country. We've had that discussion, we continue to have that discussion um, as a cabinet. Um, uh, my fear has always been that when you allow people on the surface, uh, we've had irresponsible people all through our country. Persons say, well, you can protect it by doing A, B, and C, but if our people do not take pride in the, the facility, then we'll always have a situation where it's destroyed. And that has always been my concern, and we've seen remnants of it in the community of Sufre. Um, I will say that when I said, as a sports minister, and I dare anybody to go and find a sports minister who would say otherwise, no sports minister wants other activities other than sports on any facility, none. I challenge anybody to go and find one that says, oh, let's just do it. No, we are concerned about it. And my disappointment was not many persons or the 
higher echelons of sports development came out in support of what I said. But now they are realizing that we cannot continue to treat VG playing field that way. We cannot continue to treat Darren Sami that way or Sufre. We need to continue the national discourse. We need to find alternative venues. Um, we, I, I have plans on how we can do this and we need to move sports in the right direction. But we need to continue to move sports in the right direction in this country. All right. Yes, Arsenal is going to win the English Premier League and they're also going to win the Champions League. Bayern is getting six this week. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see, or when are we going to see a, a blend between sports and uh, sports tourism? Well, I think we've started that blend under this government significantly. Um, this year, uh, the alternative sports is, is a, a measure of sports tourism. We had for our drag wars, we had more than 500 individuals from the diaspora and other places come to St. Lucia to enjoy drag racing and the Kakabef. Um, when we started the alternative sports, we also thought of chess, we also thought of drafts and all those other activities that the sum total of may actually attract more people on island than the traditional sport and we've seen and uh, we've been seeing that. The establishment of the aquatic center, 50 meter and a 25 meter pool, is also going to be a huge sport tourism initiative simply because uh, the colder nations during their off season they have St. Lucia as an alternative to come and enjoy cooler weather, enjoy the beach, enjoy the sand, and a facility in the tropics. And so we're certainly looking forward to the completion of that aquatic center next year and for schools to be engaged, for other countries to be engaged, clubs, swimming clubs to be engaged to come and take part in our sports and our social life in St. Lucia. Are we going to see uh, a friendly match between a Premier League team in St. Lucia? in a couple of years. We've, we've made attempts to bring representatives so, so far from clubs, including Arsenal, um, to visit St. Lucia. We continue to, to push towards that. We believe there are huge benefits to doing so. We believe in offering different concessions so that they could come and enjoy St. Lucia and post St. Lucia over their social media. And it's certainly something that we're hoping that can get more and more traction through our semi-pro league. We're certainly hoping that scouts will come down to St. Lucia and some of the big names, uh, past and present um, footballers, will come to St. Lucia, be a part of our semi-pro league, part of some of the programs that we have for these young men, and uh, certainly post St. Lucia for the rest of the world to see. How ambitious is it to have the FIFA World Cup in the Caribbean? Very ambitious. The dynamics of a FIFA World Cup would require something similar to what we've seen for cricket. Um, it would have to be USA, um, St. Lucia, or USA, the region, and probably Central America. Um, but we are seeing that already Central America and North America will be hosting um, a version of the World Cup very soon. Um, that would have been amazing. Then we would have been able to uh, boast of a George Audelum facility being available, uh, which is why this government uh, is being very, very forward thinking and ensuring that as soon as we have individuals away from uh, moving away f to St. Jude's, that we can start work on that facility in anticipation of whatever global event that the region may collectively come together to enjoy. Any thoughts on the, the semi-pro semi semi football league that's currently in the league? Yes, very good. Um, we, we are embarking on more marketing campaigns to ensure that more persons are sensitized about the semi-pro league. The response from the diaspora has been overwhelming. We had the sports ministers conference and every sports minister in the OECS, they want to know how their footballers could come to St. Lucia to enjoy our competition. But as we said, we are going to uh, crawl before we walk and run. So this year, it's all about our local footballers being on display. And then we're going to have a transfer window and invite all clubs from all around the world to really start looking into St. Lucia and investing in the clubs. It simply means that if an Arsenal team, for instance, invests in uh, Eden Eve Charles in Grosley, we know that the club in Grosley would yield significant benefits from that happening. And so this is what we've been looking at in terms of establishing the semi-pro league, and it has tremendous potential. Our national swim team continues to do well at Carifta. Mm -hmm. um, they've secured several medals. 
how do you think our team continues to perform well in the absence of an Olympic standard size? Yes, this government did not spare any efforts in establishing the Olympic size pool for them. We've, we've run into many different roadblocks on our way, but I'm very, very confident that before the end of next year, we'll be seeing uh, a, a ribbon cutting ceremony for that facility. Um, but uh, I, I think they, they are some of the more courageous people that we've seen in sports in St. Lucia, the Swimming Association, they've been doing their thing very well organized, um, very well put together, the likes of Eddie Hazel and his team. Um, my heart goes out to them that this facility is not complete, but they know that they have a minister that from day one has been working assiduously to ensure that we have this facility for swimmers in St. Lucia. And I believe when we do establish that facility, they would have absolutely no excuse but to produce somebody similar to Julian Alfred, and I will not rest until they do. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if you want to start off with your questions, if you have any. Yes. yes. So just yeah. hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so we saw the launch of Carnival, and as with anything, a lot of people have opinions about it. One of them it being um, something where, or a, a system where uh, constituency representatives go for the national queen, the national carnival queen, something like that. So as opposed to just the selection of contestants, the contestants come one from each constituency. Something well, like that. So what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, okay. I think I understand what you're saying. I don't think the National Carnival Queen pageant should be won from each constituency. Um, I, I believe the formula that is used is still the best formula. You put out a call for um, persons interested, and they send in their particulars from throughout St. Lucia, throughout St. Lucia. And then you have the auditions of all the persons, and at the end of the auditions, um, seven or whatever number, um, is chosen, and I think that's the best way to do it. The idea of doing one from each constituency, um, and just to make sure each constituency is represented, I don't think it is the right way to do it. I, I would advise each um, constituency or community to have their own pageant, and then probably ask their pageant winner to, to, to send in and to audition, and to see if they can be selected. Um, for example, in Cicero, we've had our community um, pageant. Um, we've had persons um, from Cicero take part in the National Carnival Queen pageant competition, uh, and that's how I think it should be. So, um, but you know, each one has its, each person have their own opinion. And if there's one thing about Carnival you can be sure of, they'll always be back and all. So. <laughs> Regularize, you know, um, how you call it, stadiums or entertainment centers. You know, the sports minister, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, using the, the, the playing fields for, you know, mm -hmm. extracurricular activity. Is there some impetus, some thrust in towards, you know, getting more um, entertainment facilities or centers mm -hmm. in, in, in the country? Yeah. Well, for sure, I think I have stated here previously that one of the projects we're looking at is to have a youth creativity park in Kalisak as well as an entertainment center to host um, mass gatherings, you know, and some of those shows. Um, of course, you know, Darren Sami Cricket Ground and Pigeon Point is still our preferred the, um, venues. Um, my own personal thinking on it is such that I, I don't always share the view that we should not use sporting facilities. I think we should um, build facilities that are multifunctional. We should spend money on proper surfaces that can take the wear and tear of multiple functions. Uh, and the idea of building a facility solely for cricket or solely for football, I think those days are, are, are long gone. 
Um, I, I think if you spend sufficient monies on a proper, proper surface, you can. I remember when you were building Boses in 2002, around that time. I was the permanent secretary then, and I was overseeing the project. And just one reason I explained to them when people talk about the amount we were spending on the outfield at Boses And I said, that's why we're spending so much money on a grass, on a sun outfit, because we were the first cricket ground to have a sun cap you know, in the outfield, is for us to be able to have multiple functions and it's very easy to restore it um, because of the nature of, of the surface. Um, but there are some sports people that believe a sporting facility must only be sports uh, and nothing else. Um, however, I am sensitive to the fact that we need to have dedicated facilities so you don't have to put off sporting events because you're going to have a, a, a entertainment event, if you're primarily a sporting event, you're a sporting, uh, a sporting venue, you're a sporting venue. And for you not to have, you know, sporting um, events because you're having other mass crowd events, that's why I believe I, I, I will support the establishment of an entertainment center. I, I have severe difficulties, for example, with the Central National Trust and how they, they manage in um, Pigeon Island and some of the um, the challenges, you know, um, that event promoters and even the government um, if is, you know, trying to use it. Um, but again, you know, you constantly dialogue and you try to work it out. Um, we have to understand we are an island with limited space and limited facilities, and we have to make it work. Uh, and that's that, that that's really critical. Um, so yeah, we are looking at building an entertainment center and hopefully it will be dedicated. But even in designing it, in my mind, but why can't we design it so some sporting discipline can also use it? Because we can decide to put in the surface um, gravel or some hard surface. But it means the rugby players cannot use it. Rugby doesn't have a home in Zanusia, where they use um, luckily replay playing field, which is not the best surface for rugby. But if you create a facility, when you're not using it for entertainment, some the guys in Goodlands can use it as a playing field. You know what I'm saying? Because the idea of in our limited resources having, you know, such dedicated facilities for me is a bit limiting. Mm. I'm barring the, the dependence on the government, you know, to provide this. We know the private sector. I mean, we know of the Getty, we know of Clarks, we know, you know, mm -hmm. we know there were private entities who would show up. Would there be some kind of incentive, you know, to allow these private entities to at least, you know, complement what the government is, you know, looking to push? Well, I, I think if any entity wants to set up, any private interest wants to set up an entity, um, a venue, they can approach government for incentives. Um, you know, that, that for me is a, is a no-brainer. Um, and government would always be willing to look at that. Yeah. Drawing back to Carnival, we know that with the increased um, promotion of Carnival, um, concerns are being raised that our culture is being lost and that it is becoming over-sexualized. What are your thoughts on this? Well, we've been through that many times before. Carnival is our culture. It's part of our culture. Culture is dynamic, it's, it's not static, it's not um, frozen in time. You know, culture will change, there'll be unwanted influences and there'll be welcome influences. And we've been through that, you know, so many times in, in the past. Um, you know, I even remember many years ago, um, I was associated with a carnival ban and there are more things that were being said about bikinis and bikini and bra and, you know, and, you know, Basically, the, the concerns that it should still be very traditional and it should not be just beads and bikini and bra. Um, and it's all about finding the right balance and making sure you have a multiplicity of interest represented in, in the art form. I mean, the, who says you cannot have a theme, vibrant theme, even historical theme represented you know, in the traditional forms, you know, does it always have to be, you know, um, a lot of cloth and coal pot on your head and, you know, that kind of stuff for you to be traditional. Um, so I, I really believe you, you have to have all ideas, content, all influences shown. Um, we must at the same time, though, um, recognize that um, we must keep something which is distinctively St. Lucian about it. 
uh, about the product. There must be. Um, I'm a big supporter of King and Queen of the Bands, for example, because I believe no place where you get greater expression of creativity and design than in the King and Queen of the Bands. Um, so you have to have those elements. You must support those aspects of the, the mass that are, are um, his, of historical significance and putting an emphasis on creativity and whatnot. But at the same time, you have to respond to market demand to some extent. Um, you know, when you look at it, for the case of Calypso, government virtually funds 90% of all expenses for Calypso in St. Lucia. <laughs> Literally, um, King and Queen of the Bands look at, you know, Panorama is another one government puts in a lot of money. The carnival bands uh, and maybe the soca shows um, can be uh, the private parties, you know, make money, but the other elements don't, and government has to come in to support it. Um, so we need to constantly be aware that we should manage the unwanted influences and really promote um, the, the more welcoming aspects of it. Um, after last year's carnival, the Christian Council actually met with me to express their views. I think the Archbishop had penned a piece um, about you know, the Bamba Mall and some of those other aspects. And we had a frank dialogue on it. Uh, and we did agree to work with the, the church and hopefully um, we will be, you'll be seeing that reflected in this year's carnival where we will have a moral responsibility campaign to say to persons, Carnival, because it's carnival, it doesn't mean you have to be lewd and you have to be, you know, behaving in inappropriate ways. It doesn't mean that. You, you can enjoy yourself without crossing the boundaries. And we will work with the church, and they provide spiritual guidance for us um, to reinforce those messages. The same way last year we started a campaign um, to drink and live responsibly, to say to individuals, you don't have to get drunk to enjoy carnival. You know, and also you don't have to drink all those carbonated drinks, high sugar, um, you know, so you can, um, you know, enjoy carnival and, and live responsibly. So we had water stops along the way. Uh, we tried to promote, you know, Coke Zero, for example, or Coke No, no Sugar, whichever one, um, because we want persons to enjoy carnival and to live responsibly. We want them to enjoy carnival and act in, with moral responsibility. Uh, and you will see more of those uh, messages reflected. Okay, um, you mentioned the National Trust. I, it brought something back to mind. Whenever we talk about um, cultural preservation and these things, especially for what happened in River Dory, I mean, the, the, the main thing is, is money. There needs to be a lot of significant investment by the government to, to preserve this and to continue preserving it. So from your standpoint as culture minister, what can you say is the government's position on continuing to invest for the preservation of culture? Well, the government is doing quite a lot. You just look at the estimates for the last three years since this government came in, and you will see the significant increases in allocation um, for creative industries and culture. I mean, this year alone, we increased it by $700,000. Uh, more money is being made available to the CDF for training and development programs. Um, you will see quite a lot of money being put in for training for dance, you know, for, for musicians. There's quite a lot. We've put in more money in La Rose, La Marguerite. We've started Emancipation Month celebration. We've put in more money in um, Creole Heritage Month. Um, there's a lot more resources that have been put in in the last three years in creatives, um, culture, work of the government. And it's because we believe in providing support. And as we, I mean, we've achieved some major, um, you know, objectives in tourism. And you'll see this year and next year, we're shifting more towards the creatives and the culture um, because we believe those are essential components of our national development. Okay, so we recently saw the launch of the Jazz, St. Lucia Jazz and Arts Festival. Last year, we had some stage management issues with artists. What has been being put in place this year to prevent this from happening? Um, some of those issues really beyond your control. Um, you set your standards for how you want your event um, to be managed and unfold, and you expect artists to, to fall in line, and you manage it as best as you can. Um, we are festival 30 odd years. Um, we have a certain reputation, certain standards, and that, that's going to be it. So we, we're going to continue to work with artists as much as possible to make sure 
um, that you know we've met the obligations uh, we have under the contract, and likewise they do. Um, so I'm hoping we have no, um, you know, aberrations this year, and that all will be okay. In fact, we're looking forward to having a phenomenal Art and Jazz Festival this year. It's really going to be special from all indications. Ticket sales are ahead of what it was last year, and last year was massive in terms of attendance. Um, the planning, we're going to refine quite a few elements. So the traffic management was our biggest deficiency last year, and we're going to put in, in place, and very soon, there'll be a public announcement of the traffic management plan for jazz. St. Lucians, are, I'm calling on all St. Lucians to, um, to cooperate with the arrangements, to find out about it. And if everybody just cooperates, we'll have a fantastic um, system in place. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. I think the look and feel of the venue will be enhanced. So last year, people were really blown away with the lighting. Um, this year will be even better. So they can expect to see um, a real fantastic look and feel. Um, the layout will be improved even more. Um, so persons going there will find it easier to get the food and the drink. And, you know, so it, it, it will be really good, great this year. And of course, Carnival too, I believe, will be epic this year. Mm -hmm. CPL says uh, they generated approximately 55 million US dollars on mm -hmm. the economy. Mm -hmm. Is that a good return on investment, or what are your thoughts about that piece of information? Well, um, yeah, I saw the data from CPL. Um, I've had a long experience in especially cricket, the economic impact of cricket. Um, so I'm a big supporter of sports and the impact it can have. And we, we, we believe the CPL is, is value for money. Um, we've had some frank exchanges with CPL where we believe we can be better and where we believe they can also be better in terms of delivering a product that can even bring greater benefits um, to us. Um, some of the challenges in the last couple of years were not CPL's responsibilities or fault because regional travel, as we know, is still um, quite challenging. But um, we believe the CPL can grow even more. And we believe it can have an even greater impact in St. Lucia. So we, we are working with them this year um, to ensure that happens. Okay, the second piece of data, if you if you're privy to it already, uh, the Central Statistics Office, Office has said that the unemployment average about 14% Nationally, mm. last year, is that a good number? And why should uh, any government or your government be proud of that number? Well, I mean, we're very proud of it, and we work it with even lower, even lower. And I think with the projects that Prime Minister announced um, during the estimates and some of the announcements he will make at the policy statement at the end of April, um, you will see there's a lot of space for optimism that the number will go even lower. Uh, and we are working hard to do so. Um, what will be critical for us is to make sure that St. Lucians make use of the opportunities that exist, because it doesn't make sense that jobs have been created because there are new um, hotels, new investment projects, and uh, infrastructural development taking place in the country, and jobs have been created. And our people you know, are still saying there are no jobs, and the developers are saying, look, we need persons to work, uh, and that, that issue has to be resolved. Um, you know, we, we really need to do a lot of training in terms of both soft skills training as well as skills training, hard skills training for our unemployed, because it's one thing to say, come to a, a skills training class and I teach you basic masonry, carpentry, whatnot, but the attitude is not there. The idea of waking up five o'clock, getting ready to take the bus at seven, to get to a, a site for eight o'clock, and to work eight to four, and then to go home and to come back and do it next morning is a discipline. Uh, and we need to reinforce and make sure that persons who want work are developing the attitudinal um, dispositions needed for that kind of work. And you know, we really have to talk about productivity as well, because developers are saying to you, you, you or even employers, that they really have an issue with productivity. So there, there are challenges for us in the society generally. But I expect that number to go even lower. Um, the lower the number goes, the lower it goes, the better for the country. It means more of our citizens are productively engaged. They are earning revenue. They are earning money they can spend on their families. And that, you know, is better for everybody. So certainly working hard for us to make it 
um, even better. Yeah. Maybe the hardest question that will come will be on this side as usual. Uh, the opposition believes in uh visa-free access to the Schengen region is at risk because Saint Lucia hasn't <coughs> signed on to an MOU. What's the status of our visa-free access? Well, I, I, I read the statement made by um, Dominic Fede. And I must say I had difficulty even understanding the statement, uh, seriously, um, because it, it just did not make sense to me. And maybe somebody in the media can, you know, help him out a bit. So, for example, he, he speaks, well, last year after the announcement was made that Dominica had lost their visa free to the UK, they said St. Lucia was losing it and it's because of CIP, Hilaire, blah, blah, blah. That has not happened. St. Lucia did not sign the MOA and now we're going to lose Europe for the same thing. But in his statement, he makes some strange, strange com um, well, claims, one of which is the reduction of the price from 200,000 to 100,000. But that was done by his government. But why we, we're not responsible for this? When we passed the legislation in 2015 for the CIP, we had 200,000. We had an annual limit of 500. We had a net worth of $3 million. We, we had those in place. They removed it. They reduced the prices to bring it in line with the other islands. And then to claim that they are the ones, we are the ones who reduce the price. But how could you be part of a government? You reduce the price. We went to parliament. We had a parliamentary debate on it and boldly post and send a statement to an outlet, media outlet, saying that it was the last, this government that did it. He spoke about, you know, the, the Russia and St. Lucia was the last to put sanctions on Russian applications, but that's not true. I mean, we were among the first to do so. But we said, when we were doing it, we already had people who had applied in the system. And I remember coming in this room and explaining that we cannot just throw them out. I mean, we're likely to be sued. There are people we have approved and are waiting to make their final in investment you cannot just remove them. You know, those people have legal rights. And in any case, we were asking genuine questions. Does it apply to everybody who was born in Russia, or is it persons living in Russia? Because there are Russians living in the United States because of the war. They would not be able to get renewals of their passports. They need travel documents. They already work in the United States. They have American visas to allow them to work there. They've been cleared already. Why can't we consider them? So we, there was a discussion going on. And that's how responsible governments um, act. So the idea that St. Lucia and this government um, was the last is not true. Um, and, and let me just repeat our position on the MOA. Every provision of the MOA, St. Lucia supports except one. The provisions of the MOA, we've already implemented them. Some of them are in our legislation. They're not a non-binding agreement. They are, re they are provided by law in St. Lucia. No other island has a more robust due diligence process than St. Lucia, none. The one provision we had a challenge with is the reduction of the, the increase of the price from 100,000 to 200,000. And we wanted a, a, a discussion on it. Why? Because we were already up there. The last government brought down the price in line with every country. Since then, we have negotiated financing, um, negotiated projects in housing, in infrastructure. And now they want the price to go up to 200. And we said, well, look, you've built all your houses, all your roads, all your hospitals. We haven't. We're just about to start. Well, can we get a grandfather clause that says, let our contract runs out, and then we are prepared to increase? And they decided to go ahead and sign it. We have to protect the interests of St. Lucia. We have to protect the interests of our people. And our view is that we're not against it. We wanted it from 2015 to be like that. In fact, more than just risk, we wanted an annual quota. We wanted a network for each individual applying. Those were the standards St. Lucia had set. So we have no difficulty in putting in place arrangements, thing, and, and we support the, the, the efforts of the countries. But we were saying, give us some time so we can exhaust our arrangements that we have in place. And we're still hoping at the end of the day, you know, some of our suggestions, because I mean, I'm sure Prime Minister now is in Brussels and he'll be a meeting over the next couple of days. So Lucia has quite a few suggestions we want to make as to how to strengthen the program. And we hope when we present it, they will all be agreed to. Thank you very much.